Intermolecular forces, that'll be the topic of this last lesson in the first chapter of my organic chemistry playlist. And uh, we'll talk about hydrogen bonding, dipole dipole forces, London dispersion forces, and even a brief mention of ion dipole forces. Now, this first chapter has all been a review of Gen Chem. In the last lesson, we talked about polarity, and that was really just a setup for this lesson so we could talk about dipole dipole forces as it's polar molecules that have these. And once we polish off this chapter, we'll really get into kind of organic chemistry proper in chapter two. Now, again, this is my brand new organic chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020, 2021 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications. You'll be notified every time I put one of these up. All right, so intermolecular forces, take a look at that name. So intermolecular means between molecules. So, so first off, you have to have molecules. And so this only applies to molecular compounds. It doesn't apply to ionic compounds. It doesn't apply to network covalent compounds like diamond or quartz, silicon dioxide. So uh, only to molecular compounds made of nonmetals, but again, not diamond, not quartz. All right, so all these lovely intermolecular forces, you should first off realize that these are between separate molecules. It's not what actually holds a molecule together. So the force that actually holds a molecule together is typically covalent bonds. But if I have one molecule over here and one molecule over here, there's a little stickiness between those separate molecules. That's what we're talking about with intermolecular forces. Uh, and, and generally the nature of that's really gonna come down to plus and minus in, in some way, shape or form as we'll see. Uh, these intermolecular forces are much weaker than you know, ionic and covalent bonds. So much weaker than what we'd actually call a bond. We'll even find that hydrogen bonding, the strongest of our intermolecular forces, is usually on the order of like 25 to 100 fold weaker than an actual covalent bond. So uh, even if we call it hydrogen bonding, you might just be like, well, it's not really like an actual covalent bond or something like that. It's much, much, much weaker. All right, so hydrogen bonding is the strongest of our intermolecular forces, followed by dipole-dipole forces, and then London dispersion forces. Now, the ion dipole forces actually can be even stronger than any of these, truth be told. So, but I'm leaving those out last because they're only going to be present in mixtures, whereas these three can be present in pure liquids or in mixtures. And they're very useful if we're comparing, say, the boiling points of a bunch of pure liquids, whereas this one wouldn't be relevant at all. So I'll save that for the end, but truth be told, ion dipole forces can even be stronger than hydrogen bonding. So, uh, but it, as far as, as long as just talking about these three, hydrogen bonding will be the strongest, then dipole dipole, then London dispersion. Uh, and that, that assumption though is meaning that all molecules are similar in size. We'll see the importance of that here in a little bit. So I'm going to start with dipole dipole forces and we'll see why. So uh, for dipole dipole forces, you've got to have polar molecules. Now in this case, HCl has definitely got a, a dipole moment. It's a polar molecule. So Chlorine's more electronegative, so it's partially negative. The hydrogen, less electronegative, partially positive. We could also represent that with our lovely drawing of a bond dipole. Same thing on the adjacent molecule here, partial positive, partial negative. And the interaction between the partially negative part of this molecule and the partially positiveness uh, of the adjacent molecule, that interaction right there is what we term the dipole-dipole force. Now here I've got two identical molecules, like you'd have in a pure liquid, but you can have this in mixtures as well. The only requirement was is that both molecules in the mixture have to be polar for the interaction between them to be classed as dipole-dipole forces. And the more polar the molecule, the greater the dipole-dipole forces. All right, wanted to start there because hydrogen bonding is really nothing too much more than a super duper strong dipole-dipole force. So the most common molecule we see with hydrogen bonding, and the most famous is water. Cool, and once again, you've got partial negatives, partial positive. You've got partially negative oxygens and partially positive hydrogens, since those oxygen hydrogen bonds are definitely pretty darn polar. Okay, so in this case, the interaction, we actually show that it's mediated through one of the lone pairs on the oxygens, but that interaction between the oxygen, let's do this in a different color, between the lone pair on the oxygen in this case and that partially positive hydrogen, that is what we're terming as hydrogen bonding. And again, this is much weaker than an actual covalent bond. Like this line right here represents an actual covalent bond. That's way stronger force holding this oxygen and hydrogen to, you know, next to each other within a single molecule. We might call that an intramolecular force. But this between the separate molecules, that's the hydrogen bonding, much weaker than an actual covalent bond. Now, there are some specific requirements to be capable of hydrogen bonding. Not just any old hydrogen will qualify. It has to be a, a hydrogen that's very partially positive. 
And in that case, that means your hydrogen has to be bonded to a fluorine, bonded to an oxygen, or bonded to a nitrogen. I like to think of those as the phone elements. Those are the only hydrogens that actually can participate in hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding always involves hydrogen, but definitely most hydrogens don't even qualify. It's only hydrogens bonded to F, O, or N that, are, that can do this. And the reason, again, is that only if they're bonded to F, O, or N will they have a significant enough amount of partial positive charge to take part in this hydrogen bonding. Cool, and once again, I showed hydrogen bonding for two identical molecules like you'd see in a pure liquid, like pure water in this case. But again, you can also see it in mixtures where things just get a little more challenging to see. So let me draw a molecule of formaldehyde for a minute. In fact, let me draw two of them. So there's formaldehyde. So formaldehyde definitely has partially negative oxygens as those carbon oxygen bonds are definitely polar. The carbons would be partially positive. But what I wanna show here is that if you have pure formaldehyde where all your molecules are just formaldehyde, there's no hydrogen bonding. You do have a partially negative oxygen, but you don't have a partially positive hydrogen. Now in explaining hydrogen bonding, we often talk about the hydrogen bond donor and the hydrogen bond acceptor. The hydrogen bond donor is the molecule providing the hydrogen that's bonded to an F, an O, or an N. And we can see that water, yep, water's got a hydrogen bond donor. And then the hydrogen bond acceptor is the F, the O, or the N that has the lone pair of electrons. And so in this case with formaldehyde, if I look, formaldehyde's got an F, or an O, or an N, in this case an O, that has lone pairs. He's got a hydrogen bond acceptor but he does not have any hydrogen bond donors because the H's that are present are not bonded to F, O, or N. They're bonded to carbon. And as a result, this bond's not polar. And therefore, these hydrogens don't have any significant amount of partial positive charge. And so formaldehyde molecules have the ability to act as hydrogen bond acceptors, but they don't have the ability to act as donors. And so in pure formaldehyde, no hydrogen bonding taken place. They are polar, so there is dipole-dipole forces, but no hydrogen bonding. Now, on the other hand, if you mix formaldehyde with water, Again, we said formaldehyde molecules, they can still act as hydrogen bond acceptors, just not donors. Well, water's like, well, great. You can act as an acceptor because I can act as the donor. And so the interaction here between the lone pair on the oxygen of formaldehyde with one of the hydrons of water, that would also be hydrogen bonding. And so this usually leads to a couple different types of questions. We might ask you, which of the following is capable of hydrogen bonding as a pure liquid? Well, if that's the case, you gotta have an FH, an OH, or NH bond somewhere in your structure. But the other one might be, which of the following uh, can take part in hydrogen bonding when mixed with something like water, with something that can already act as a hydrogen bond donor? And in that case, like formaldehyde, all you really need in that case is to be a hydrogen bond acceptor, which means you gotta have an F, an O, or an N that's got lone pairs, that's it. So those are kind of the two different distinctions you might see that, that coming up with. All right, so last but not least among these three is London dispersion forces, which generally regarded as the weakest of those three. So, and London dispersion forces are a little bit strange. So we like to call it a weak, uh, temporary or transient dipole. And so these are easiest to see in nonpolar molecules. So because for a nonpolar molecule, that's all it's got. But the truth is London dispersion forces are present in all molecules. Water has them, HCl has them, formaldehyde has them. So, but we just normally wouldn't talk about it with say water, because if you've got super glue, don't talk about scotch tape, right? So the super glue being the hydrogen bonding, and this would be like the scotch tape. Well, if you got super glue, then the scotch tape doesn't really do much. So kind of think of that, but London dispersion forces, again, often the weakest of the three, but all molecules have them. Now, if you're non-polar, well, then you're not gonna be capable of hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole forces. So all you're gonna be capable of is these London dispersion forces. Now, again, they're weak, temporary dipole. So say I'm a nonpolar molecule, say you're a nonpolar molecule as well. So is there any plus minus attraction that should be present in us? Well, permanently no, but the key is it's not just, it's not permanent, it's temporary. And the reason is because we both have electrons. I've got electrons as a molecule, you've got electrons as a molecule, and, and my electrons are rotating around me. And for a brief instant freeze, my electrons might be more in front of me than behind me. And so facing you, I've got a partial negative charge. And so what you'll do is you'll swing your electrons around behind you, that way facing me, you've got a partial positive charge. And I'll be like, hey, I didn't notice before, but we should totally hang out, you're totally cool. And then my electrons move and I'm like, oh, never mind. So and that's kind of the idea. So it's weak because these are small amounts of partial positive and partial negative charge. And it's temporary because the electrons might move and things shift and things of that sort.
Now, these, it turns out, are dependent upon three things, these London dispersion forces. So they are dependent upon size. And oftentimes we'll look at molecular weight, but molecular weight's not a perfect reflection of this, but it's the most common one we'll look at. So size and then surface area. And the idea is that molecules that just have more surface area have a greater area over which they can interact and stick to each other. Uh, and then finally, polarizability is the last. And that might be a term you got in Gen Chem, it might not be. So, but polarizability just deals with, you know, the ability to, to form partial positive and negative charges, uh, which is kind of the, the nature of the London dispersion forces. So it's, it, truth be told, is not the most explanatory term. So, however, there is a trend for polarizability as you go down the periodic table, down a group, the atoms get bigger and their electron clouds get squishier. And that's not a technical term, but they get squishier. And by squishier, what can happen is you can squish that electron cloud into different shapes, which allows it to be more partially negative in one area and more partially positive in another area. And so atoms that are bigger as you go down the periodic table, being more polarizable, are going to lead to these greater temporary dipoles, these greater London dispersion forces. So, so these are the three things that really affect and, and it's really the first two that you're going to encounter much more often in organic chemistry. I'm just covering my bases on this last one, but the truth is you may never see a question that requires you to know this last one. All right, now ion dipole forces, and, and we didn't really talk about these in the same breath because again, Ion dipole forces are only going to be present in a mixture. These three, hydrogen bonding, dipole, dipole, dipole dispersion, they can be present in pure liquids or mixtures, which is useful. So because in pure liquids, we can compare based on these intermolecular forces, things like boiling points, melting points, surface tension, viscosity, and things of this sort. Um, whereas ion dipole forces are only going to be present in a mixture, and we wouldn't talk about the boiling point of a mixture in the same kind of context. So, but cool, but you still got to know what these are. And these ion dipole forces, by the very name, imply a mixture. You've got to have something that has ions, an ionic compound, and something polar. And usually the most common example we deal with is dealing with dissolving ionic compounds in polar liquids. So for example, if you stick sodium chloride in water, the sodium ions are going to get surrounded by water molecules. And specifically, it is the oxygen atoms that are going to interact most closely with those sodium ions. And we could draw the chloride ions as well, but therefore it would be the partially positive hydrogens that would interact most closely with those chloride ions. So, but these would be ion dipole interactions and they can be rather strong. Now they depend on a couple of things. They depend on how polar the liquid is. The more polar it is, the stronger the forces, but it also depends on the charge and size of the ions. Greater charges like more positive or more negative lead to stronger interactions. And also smaller ions can form shorter and stronger ion dipole forces as well. And, Cool, that's not going to be super relevant, truth be told, in this chapter, but we will draw back on this a little bit later on in the course when we start explaining some different trends in reactivity for a certain specific type of reaction. Okay, so I want to focus back on pure liquids for a little bit, which means, again, we're only talking about these three intermolecular forces, and we want to talk about some of the, the bulk properties of a substance that are affected by these intermolecular forces, and, and the most common one we'll compare in organic chemistry is the boiling point. And so when you boil a liquid, you're going from uh, the liquid phase where the molecules are like in contact and touching to the gas phase where they're separated by huge amounts of empty space. And so to get there, to go from liquid to gas, any stickiness holding the liquid molecules together has to be broken. And greater intermolecular forces means more energy is going to be required to break them and you'll end up with a higher boiling point. Now it works very similar for the melting point as well to go from solid to liquid. You have to break some of those intermolecular forces and so higher intermolecular forces lead to higher melting or freezing points as well. Same point. Uh, higher viscosity as well and viscosity uh, we like to think of as, you know, how thick a liquid pours. Well, the truth is it talks about friction between layers of flowing fluid. And the stronger the intermolecular forces, the greater the friction between them and they want to flow together. And so that's why things that are more viscous pour more thickly for our non-technical definition of viscosity there. But greater intermolecular forces, greater viscosity as well. Same thing with surface tension. Greater intermolecular forces lead to greater surface tension. Now, uh, surface tension is the whole reason that a water bug can walk on water. You've got this network of hydrogen bonding at the surface of water, and the water bug is one light enough, and it spreads its little tiny weight over a broad enough surface area that it actually doesn't weigh enough to poke through that network of hydrogen bonding going on inside of water. And so as a result, water bugs can walk on water. But greater intermolecular forces, again, lead to a stronger network at the surface and are therefore a greater surface tension. Uh, cool. So 
higher in molecular forces lead to higher boiling point, higher melting point, higher viscosity, higher surface tension. There is one thing that gets lower though, and that's called vapor pressure. And again, you probably saw this in Gen Chem as well. Um, vapor pressure is really just a measure of the number of molecules that have made it into the vapor phase around a solid or liquid. Most commonly we look at it around a liquid. So uh, when a liquid evaporates, some of those molecules make it into the vapor phase. Now again, those liquid molecules are touching, they're in contact, and they're held together at least to some degree. So by intermolecular forces. And the stronger those forces, the more they're held together. And every once in a while, one's gonna break for the surface and break away from all the other liquid molecules and make it into the vapor phase and fly around. So the stickier the liquid molecules though, the harder it's gonna to be to break away and get into the vapor phase and the lower the vapor pressure as a result. That vapor pressure is really just a measure of how many molecules have made it into the vapor phase. And so that's why with higher intermolecular forces, you end up with a lower vapor pressure. Cool. So all of these bulk properties uh, are, are gonna be kind of related to our intermolecular forces. But again, the one we'll compare the most often in organic chemistry is gonna be that boiling point. So now we're gonna kind of go through some rules and, and some different examples that you might see for comparing boiling points. Okay, so now we'll look at some criteria for ranking boiling points. Now, uh, the truth is, most of the time it's really just gonna be about points three on down. So however, I just wanted to cover my bases just in case. So, but your highest boiling points are really gonna be associated with network covalent solids. That's diamond and silicon dioxide are the only two you really gotta concern yourself with, maybe graphite. Um, and yes, they have really, really high boiling points and you're not likely to encounter them in organic chemistry. So I'm just covering my bases. Uh, the next is gonna be ionic compounds and you might see these every once in a while and it means you've got plus and minus ions. So in, back in Gen Chem, we use the, you know, the, the metal, non-metal kind of ideology for identifying ionic compounds. So, and we'll kind of see that potentially uh, every once in a blue moon, but we're not gonna really see that that often as well, but it can show up and I'll do an example of it actually here shortly. Um, and ionic compounds tend to have significantly higher boiling points than our other molecular, than our, the rest, you know, all of our molecular compounds, simply because you have to break ionic bonds to actually boil them and which are way stronger than our intermolecular forces. But if you don't have any network covalent you know, solids and any ionic compounds, that's, then you'll be starting here at hydrogen bonding. And if all you've got is molecular compounds, then that's the first thing you look for is hydrogen bonding. So if you've got an OH, an FH, an NH bond somewhere in your structure, you'll be capable of hydrogen bonding, and that's gonna be one of the rather strong intermolecular forces here. After that, you'd start looking for dipole-dipole forces, and then we know that all molecules have London dispersion forces. We'll talk about when that would be relevant in the comparison you're kind of looking at. So, but this is kind of the criteria you look for. So, uh, and again, these first two, oftentimes, most of the time, you'll eliminate those as being not even possibilities. Uh, but I will start with one example with an ionic one here, as we'll see. So, if I want to compare the boiling point of these top two here, so boiling point again, higher intermolecular forces leads to higher boiling points. And I'd look and say, do I have any network covalent solids just to cover my bases? Well, yep, no diamond, no silicon dioxide completely irrelevant to this question. Okay, do I have any ionic compounds? And actually, ding, 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 you see a negative ion, a positive ion right next to each other? We have an ionic compound. Now in Gen Chem, we just said, well, sodium's a metal, oxygen's a non-metal, that's ionic. But in O Chem, most of the time, the structures you'll see, you'll actually be able to see the plus and minus right next to each other and dead giveaway, you've got an ionic compound. And because we have an ionic compound, that's gonna be a rather high boiling point. Whereas this guy right here is not ionic. He's just molecular. Now he's got hydrogen bonding because there's an OH, but it doesn't matter. The ionic compound hands down is going to have the higher boiling point between these two compounds. It's not even close. Okay. So, but like I said, most of the time, you're probably not going to have network covalent or ionic compounds in most of your comparisons. So let's look at the next one here. The next one, which of these has the highest boiling point? And I see that neither one's a network covalent solid and there's no plus minus in these. So they're not ionic compounds either. So the first thing I look for is hydrogen bonding. Do either of these have an FH, OH, or NH bond? Well, this guy's got an OH bond. will be capable of hydrogen bonding. And this guy's got an F and he's got H's but there are no FH bonds in the structure whatsoever. And so he's not gonna be capable of hydrogen bonding. And since the one on the left has hydrogen bonding and the one on the right doesn't, done. This one's going to have the higher boiling point. All right, so we've got a couple more examples of comparing boiling points here. And uh, the first one is the example on top here. So uh, I look at these and no network covalent solids, no ionic compounds. We skip right past those criteria right off the bat. So then I look for hydrogen bonding and I look and I'm like, oh, he's got a fluorine and he's got hydrogens, but there are no fluorine hydrogen bonds. So he's not capable of hydrogen bonding. It turns out that's really important. So, but he is polar, and so he's gonna have dipole-dipole forces. So, 
And then he's also obviously going to have limited dispersion forces because all molecules have those. Now, this molecule, though, made up of only carbons and hydrogens. It's a hydrocarbon. Well, carbon-carbon bonds are not polar, but carbon-hydrogen bonds we learned in the last lesson are also not polar. Since there's no polar bonds in this structure, it is a nonpolar molecule, and hydrocarbons tend to be fairly nonpolar, if not completely nonpolar. Cool. And as a result, then, he does not have dipole-dipole forces, only has lunar dispersion forces. Now, again, I want to put a, a line in the sand here. So again, if these are the only three intermolecular forces you have, then you should look for hydrogen bonding first. And as long as all the molecules you're comparing, or both of the molecules comparing, if they're only comparing two, are similar in size, then yeah, hydrogen bonding wins the day. And the more hydrogen bonding you have, the stronger the intermolecular forces. But if there's no hydrogen bonding, then you'd start looking for dipole-dipole forces. But notice again, I've been careful to say if you're comparing molecules of the same size because something gets a little funky if you're not comparing molecules of the same size. Now, if your molecules are not the same size, hydrogen bonding usually still wins the day, even if it's on the smaller molecule. It turns out to you know, overcome not having hydrogen bonding compared to a molecule that has it, you'd have to be like you know, five or 10 times bigger than the molecule that had hydrogen bonding for that to even come close. So it's huge differences. That's not usually the comparison we give you. However, if hydrogen bonding's off the table, like it is in this example here. So then you have a problem because dipole-dipole isn't such a strong force that, like, like hydrogen bonding is that it makes as big of a difference. And so all of a sudden, if you've got a nonpolar molecule like this one and a polar molecule like this one, well, if the nonpolar molecule's big enough in comparison, it might actually have stronger intermolecular forces. And the truth is, the nonpolar one, it might only have to be like 15% bigger. It's not a huge difference. Whereas again, for a nonpolar molecule to have greater intermolecular forces than a molecule that had hydrogen bonding, it might have to be five to 10 times bigger, 500 to a thousand percent, you know, bigger, something along those lines. So in this case, you got to ask yourself if there's no hydrogen bonding on the table as well, then really, it's really just going to come down to size is the most important factor. If all you're dealing with is these two, because any significant increase or, you know, uh, difference in size uh, by the nonpolar molecule, would make it so that it has enough London dispersion forces to overcome its lack of dipole-dipole. And so when I look at these two molecules, they're not even close in size. And if they're not close in size, dipole-dipole just doesn't matter that much. And you should just base it on who's got the greater London dispersion forces based on who's got the greater size. And as a result, this one's going to have a higher boiling point by far. Again, if you throw hydrogen bonding in the mix, like let's say we take this F off of here and I put an OH there. And all of a sudden, now it's got hydrogen bonding. Now, this was not the example we were asked, but if we did this, all of a sudden now, hydrogen bonding again is such a strong intermolecular force that it overcomes big differences in size. And in this case, I would not have circled the one on the right. I'd go back to circling the one on the left with a higher boiling point. But again, the question really was with just a plain old flooring there, not capable of hydrogen bonding, only dipole-dipole forces. And in that case, the larger molecule, if it's more than 15% larger, is going to win. So we usually ask you these in one of two contexts then. We either give you two molecules that are very close in size and one's polar and one's not, and you should pick the polar one. Or we give you two molecules like here that are not very close in size, in which case polarity ends up not mattering so much. Now hydrogen bonding still would, but plain old dipole-dipole forces would not. All right. And now we're going to get a little more organic-y on you here. So we've got these last two molecules. They're both hydrocarbons. They're both nonpolar. And so the only intermolecular force is London dispersion forces. And you look at the one on the left, and it's got one, two, three, four. It's a five-carbon chain, we say. And the one on the right is a one, two, three, four, five, six-carbon chain. As a result, the one on the right has a bigger size and a bigger surface area, and therefore is going to have greater London dispersion forces, greater overall intermolecular forces, and a higher boiling point. Cool, and that's another common comparison you're likely to see. All right, now we gotta talk about one oddity that deals with branching. And so we usually talk about branching of hydrocarbons here as these got these two hydrocarbons here. And so uh, if you look, both these have five carbons, both cases, and 12 hydrogens. So they have exactly the same molecular weight. So we'd say they have the same size, but it turns out they don't have the same surface area. So if you look, this structure on the right, we say is more branched. It has more branching, we like to say. And what more branching does, is it gives you a more compact structure. Like take this piece of paper. If I coated one side in some sort of glue and stuck it to the board, you'd probably expect it with any kind of re reasonable glue to stick. But if I took that same paper and coated it with glue again and crumpled it up and then stuck it to the board, 
So it might stick, it might not, but it has a less likely chance, you know, less of a chance to stick. And the idea is that its interaction with the board is now over a much smaller surface area. And so that's the idea is when you get a more compact structure due to branching, it's gonna have lower surface area. And if it has lower surface area, it's gonna have lower London dispersion forces. Now, the only time we usually com compare this, because it's usually a fairly subtle thing, is if you have two isomers that have exactly the same molecular weight like these two. Again, they both have the same formula, C5H12. And so if you look, the boiling point of the one that's not branched, the one that has more surface area, 36.1 degrees Celsius, is higher than the boiling point of the one that is branched. Now, melting points get a little funky, and, and normally the trends for melting point and boiling point go together. But with this idea of branching, sometimes they don't. And if you notice, in this case, the one that again is not branched, now has the lower melting point. So it's got the higher boiling point, but it's got the lower melting point, negative 129.8 degrees Celsius compared to negative 16.5 degrees Celsius. And so here's where things get a little bit weird. And, and the truth is, I actually think the melting point trend shouldn't be taught. There's not a great trend here. I had to kind of, you have to kind of cherry pick your examples to make this work. But the idea is that uh, branching lowers the boiling point, but increases the melting point is how this is often taught. Sometimes actually taught as far as melting point goes, the exact opposite. So, but the idea is this, with a branched structure, it's a more compact structure, and often symmetry plays a role in this too, but branched and, and maybe even symmetry, it'll actually pack into a crystal better. And when it packs into a crystal better, it'll actually freeze at a higher temperature. And, with, and if you're looking at it the other way, from instead of liquid to solid, solid to liquid, that means it actually melts at a higher temperature temperature as well, which is why you get a higher melting point. And so it's not due to really the intermolecular forces, but how well it packs into a crystal. But again, I really had to cherry pick my examples here because there are numerous exceptions as far as melting point goes. The boiling point trend is, is pretty solid, but the melting point one is not so great. And you'll find that a lot of uh, professors just stopped asking questions about melting point. So maybe you're in a class that asks them, maybe you don't. So I'm covering my bases, but the truth is the trend is not that solid. And sometimes us as question writers, we make mistakes in asking questions that we probably shouldn't uh, as far as melting point goes. So, all right, so let's work an example involving exactly this principle. All right, so in ranking the boiling points of the example at hand here, so uh, if we kind of start looking at some formulas here, so here we've got C5H12, here C8H18, and here also, C8H18. So if we had to identify the lowest boiling point, we just pick this one by, you know, by far. He is the smallest in size. Now you might be like, well, Chad, yeah, this one's branched and this one's not. And again, we only typically are going to reserve that comparison for comparing isomers. If you got a compound that's significantly smaller, by all means, he's going to have lower intermolecular forces done. So if I was ranking these in terms of boiling point, he's going to have the lowest boiling point. Now, if I'm going to compare these two, though, they're isomers. They have exactly the same molecular weight. That's where branching can come into play. And in this case, the more branched one, that's going to have a smaller surface area and a lower boiling point. So if I rank these in terms of boiling point, I'd have number one, number two, and number three, with one being the highest and three being the lowest as far as boiling points go. Now, the question also asks for melting point, which, again, I really hate asking about melting point to students and stuff, but I'll do it here because some of you guys might be asked it. Uh, and in this case, if we're asking melting points, again, this guy's significantly smaller. He's going to have the lowest melting point as well in all likelihood. So we'll put him at number three yet again for lowest melting point. Now between these two though, and again, this trend has numerous exceptions, but if you're going to fall with the trend, so if you're comparing an unbranched structure to a very highly branched and especially symmetrical structure, so then branching typically raises the melting point. I like to think that branching brings the boiling point down, but brings the melting point up. And again, it's not always true as far as the melting point goes, but that's kind of the trend we're teaching here that will be true as long as we cherry pick our examples in giving you a very highly branched symmetrical structure compared to an unbranched structure. But if you start comparing like, you know, an unbranched structure to just a little bit branched structure or a highly branched structure to just a little bit branched, it just goes out the window. But, but in this case, it will work. And so in this case, our highly branched, highly symmetrical structure, that's gonna raise its melting point. And so he's now gonna have the highest melting point with the unbranched one now being number two. And so you're, when branching is the, the ultimate difference and the only major difference, now notice that your boiling point rankings and your melting point rankings won't necessarily be exactly the same. For most times, most comparisons you'll do, they'd follow the same trend. 
But when branching becomes the key difference, not necessarily the case. All right, the last topic in this uh, lesson on intermolecular forces is solubility. And the governing principle in solubility is that like dissolves like. Uh, and again, you might have seen this in Gen Chem, so hopefully this is, again, somewhat of a review. But what we mean with like dissolves like, like in terms of polarity. So polar solutes dissolve in polar liquids. So nonpolar solutes dissolve in nonpolar liquids, but mix polar and nonpolar, and usually solubility is not going to be so great. So that's what we mean by saying like dissolves like. And so usually we're going to give you a, a variety of compounds, and we're going to say either which one's soluble in a very polar liquid like water, or which one's going to be the most soluble in a very nonpolar liquid like hexane. And you can recognize that he's nonpolar because he's a hydrocarbon made of only carbons and hydrants and no polar bond in his structure whatsoever. So if you're looking for solubility in water, a very polar liquid, then you want to pick the one uh, that is the most polar, especially having hydrogen bonding. So if you want the most soluble in hexane, which is nonpolar, then you want to pick the, the compound that is going to be the least polar. Now, if you look at these, if we wanted the solubility in water, usually the first thing I look for is hydrogen bonding. So water's got plenty of hydrogen bonding and it's really polar, so I want it something that's also really polar and has hydrogen bonding. Great, but these all have hydrogen bonding and they all have the same amount of hydrogen bonding as well. And so in this case, that actually doesn't help us. So, uh, you know, if that were, you know, had we get, given you a comparison where you had one molecule with hydrogen bonding and one without, you'd probably pick the one with hydrogen bonding. So, but this one's a little more subtle example. So they all have a single OH. If one of these had two OHs, one over here and one over here, I'd probably pick that molecule as well, more hydrogen bonding. But again, that's not our comparison here. So here there really is the difference in the number of carbons. So here we've got three carbons, four carbons, five carbons. And if you notice this end of the molecule in, in any of these cases that has a bunch of carbons and hydrons, it has a bunch of nonpolar bonds. And so the, the end of the molecule with the OH is fairly polar. The end of the molecule without it though is pretty nonpolar. And so if I'm looking for solubility in water, then I want molecules that have lots of polarity and a minimum of low polarity regions and stuff like that. And so for solubility in water then, they all have the same amount of polar regions, 1OH, 1OH, 1OH. So then it really comes down to minimizing how big your nonpolar region is. And so in this case for solubility in water, I should choose the one with the smallest numbers of carbons and hydrogens, uh, since they all have the same number of OH bonds. All right. Now, if I was looking for solubility in hexane, on the other hand, it would be the exact opposite. Now, with a nonpolar solvent, I want as much nonpolarness to the molecule as possible. Now, these are all polar to some extent with an OH bond, but the one that's going to be the most nonpolar, or the least polar is what we really should say, is the one with the biggest hydrocarbon chain. And so for solubility in hexane, this is the one we would choose. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, please consider giving me a like and a share. Or if you just feel sorry for bald people, please consider giving me a like and a share. Uh, and if you've got questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. And if you're looking for practice problems or the outline study guides that go with this lesson, uh, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.